Welcome to the California Appellate Podcast, a discussion of timely trial tips and the latest cases and news coming from the California Court of Appeal and the California Supreme Court. And now your hosts, Tim Cole and Jeff Lewis. Welcome, everyone. I am Jeff Lewis. And I'm Tim Kowal. This podcast is a resource for trial attorneys. We try to provide news and interesting cases out of the California courts each week. Jeff and I are appellate specialists, but both our practices are split about evenly between trial and appellate courts. If you find this podcast interesting, please recommend it to a colleague. And if you find the podcast a waste of time, well, please recommend it to opposing counsel. (laughs) And a quick announcement. Our podcast is sponsored by Case Text. Case Text is a legal research tool that harnesses AI and a lightning fast interface to help lawyers find case authority fast. I've been a subscriber of Case Tech since 2019, and I highly endorse the service. Listeners of the podcast will receive a 25% lifetime discount available to them if they sign up at casetext.com slash calp. That's casetext.com slash C-A-L-P. All right, Jeff. So uh, every few weeks, we try to do an episode where we catch up on some recent interesting cases. Uh, I've uh, I've identified a few cases uh, uh, some that deal with interesting decisions on statutes that require written findings, so uh, something akin to statements of decision. Those are all those are a, a perennial source of appellate right. interest for this podcast. Uh, we got a couple of cases dealing with some interesting points of appellate procedure. Uh, we're going to talk about a case that the Supreme Court of California recently took up on review concerning arbitration waivers, and then we got a case on trial procedure, and then we'll follow that with some uh, some more news and tidbits out of the courts of appeal. So the first case I wanted to talk about had has to do with uh, written findings, requirement of written findings in certain kinds of family law proceedings involving custody orders. Um, One of the first pieces of advice an appellate attorney will give to a trial attorney is don't uh, don't forget that all important uh, statement of decision. You have to request a statement of decision. Uh, But sometimes, Jeff, when I give this advice to trial attorneys, it puzzles them because uh, they know that the trial judge after a bench trial is already required, even without a request, to give tentative decisions. And a statement of decision is usually just a copy and paste job of the tentative. So really, what's the big deal in requesting a statement of decision? Yeah, Tim, why are you... Why are you harassing trial lawyers with such uh, repetitive tasks that don't really mean anything? Funny you should ask, Jeff, because the appellant in uh, in marriage of Berger out of the 4th District, 3rd uh, Division, uh, could tell you a, a really uh, troubling story about that. So in that case, even though the trial judge had issued a written decision, the appellant lost her appeal because she failed to request a statement of decision. So Nancy Berger was uh, seeking an increased support award in that case. Uh, actually, I, I uh, incorrectly preface this case. It's not a custody uh, uh, case. It's a, a support award case. Uh, so, so the appellant had sought an increased support award from her ex-husband, Robert. Uh, Nancy argued that Robert should co- contribute more money to meet her marital standard of living. Uh, Nancy also sought her attorney's fees, and the trial judge ultimately denied her request for attorney's fees Uh, But the trial court uh, still owed her an explanation, Uh, at least according to Nancy. She argued that under Family Code Section 2030, the trial court is supposed to analyze the factors governing need-based attorney fee awards, and the court just didn't do that here. Unfortunately for Nancy, her statutory right to findings was not enough. Robert pointed out that Nancy had failed to request a statement of decision, and absent a statement of decision, the reviewing court will infer any factual findings so that are supported by substantial evidence in the record necessary to support the result. And that's why the statement of decision matters, Jeff. If Nancy had requested a statement of decision and the findings were still missing after that request, then the Court of Appeal would have been required to reverse because in that case, the record uh, would have shown that the trial court failed to exercise any discretion on those statutory factors, which, again, are required to be considered by the family judge. Instead, uh, because of the absence of the request for a statement of decision, the Court of Appeal simply presumed that the trial court did consider those factors, and the result was to affirm the denial of the support award. Okay, so no appeal was ever lost from requesting a statement of decision too many times. There you go. That's that's one of our other maxims. You can never lose an appeal by filing too many notices of appeal. You can never lose by uh, requesting a statement of decision. Uh, one of the th- reasons this caught my eye, Jeff, is because uh, it reminded me of a case that we had covered uh, from earlier this year, Abdel Kader versus Abraham 
<clears throat> that was a published case. The, uh, the Abdel Kader case came to mind uh, because it, it had come to a different result. Abdel Kader dealt with a similar statute under the Family Code that requires written findings to be made. In, in that case, it dealt with the, the statute Family Code uh, 3044, which involves the rebutting, uh, rebutting a presumption of domestic violence, uh, uh, rebutting a, a presumption of domestic violence <clears throat> uh, when it comes to support award, uh, rather when it comes to custody awards. If there's been a finding of, of domestic violence, then the court is, has a, a mandatory obligation to presume that uh, that a custody award in favor of that offender would not be in the best interest of the children. Uh, the trial court in, in the Abdel Kader case did not make the, the findings required by statute, and the appellant made the same argument as Nancy did here in this, uh, uh, in this case uh, concerning the support award. But, uh, uh, but the Abdel Kader court agreed with, the, uh, with Nancy's argument that was unsuccessful here. The Abdel Kader court held in a published opinion that where findings are required by statute, the findings are required. The end. The statute doesn't say the court has to make findings only if the appellant requests a statement of decision. It just says the statute says findings are required, so trial court, give the findings. I think, Jeff, that the same result ought to have obtained here. Just as with Section 3044 in Abdel Kader, uh, in the uh, in this case that we're just that we're talking about, uh, marriage of Berger, <clears throat> the uh, the statute. Section 2030 requires that the trial court shall make findings. That's the quote from the statute, shall make findings on various factors uh, concerning the support award. And just as, a, just as in Abdel Kader, the trial court here failed to make the required findings. So a request yeah. for statement of decision is not required where the statute independently requires that findings are to be made. You but know, the Berger ca uh, case didn't even discuss Abdel Kader. So it Seems like there's some sort of split on that issue. I'm not sure if that's a split in the law or a split or something that can be uh, based on the the factors or the purposes of the two statutes here. One concerning custody awards and another concerning support awards. Yeah, interesting. And I don't know how to reconcile those two results other than Berger was unpublished. Because uh, uh, you're right, it doesn't make sense. That is sometimes the all important uh, distinguishing factor is whether <laughs> the opinion is published. All right, so let's move on to the uh, the second case, and it's uh, it's actually another case um, that is an, uh, involves the Abdel Kader opinion. It's a, it's an unpublished uh, decision in Hutchins v. Hutchins. So we had just discussed Abdel Kader and the requirement in custody orders where there is a finding of domestic violence, uh, and in such a case, the trial court is required to make written findings rebutting the presumption that custody to the offender is not in the best interest of the children. So in this in this uh, recent case of Hutchins v. Hutchins, again in the fourth district, um, the court says uh, this time that they really mean it. Uh, I think this even starts to infringe. The, uh, uh, on the other hand, Jeff, I I, I was just about I, I just got finished telling you that I agreed with the Abdel Kader case, but here I'm going to tell you about <laughs> how they applied the Abdel Kader case here in such a way that I think implicates um, another recent Supreme Court holding that says that even if required fi uh, if findings are required to be made by the trial court uh that error in uh, the error in omitting required findings is reviewed for prejudicial error it's not structural error that requires a reversal reversal per se but uh but after i describe the facts of this case and the court's analysis you tell me if you think that that the court has uh has given true prejudicial prejudicial error review or is uh has reversed in this case under more something more like a uh, structural error standard. So uh, most findings in family court are left to the judge's discretion, but not a custody order, at least not once the judge has found that the parent has engaged in domestic violence. So even though the father's only domestic violence in the case of Hutchins v. Hutchins was ringing up the mother's employer and harassing the mother's employer about, you know, basically airing dirty laundry. It was uh, not, not appropriate, but you know, it was a question in my mind whether that amounted to domestic violence. But at any rate, the court in, in Hutchins held that the 50-50 custody order uh, could, not, uh, could not stand because the family court failed to make written findings on the seven statutory factors under Family Code Section 3044. So in this case, the family court acknowledged the presumption. So again, it found that the husband or the, the ex-husband had engaged in domestic violence 
by uh, by calling the the uh, ex the mother's employer. Um, so it acknowledged that there was a mandatory rebuttable presumption that a custody award in his in the father's favor would not be in the best interest of the children, but then just concluded that the presumption was rebutted. Uh, didn't go through each of the required factors under 3044. The Court of Appeal held this was not enough. The trial court must undertake two steps before concluding that the pres presumption had been overcome and didn't uh, didn't go through those uh, those two steps and the seven factors uh, to find that the rebuttal, rebuttable presumption was overcome. Uh, the second step, and after finding, you know, as, as all of us appellate attorneys know, Jeff, there's two things you have to establish as the appellant to get a reversal. You have to establish that there was an error, and you have to establish that the error resulted in prejudice, that there was there's some argument, uh, reasonable probability that, but for the error, the outcome would have come out the other way. Um, but on the prejudicial error analysis, the court's analysis seemed to me underwhelming. It's, it seemed to run afoul of the Supreme Court's decision in FP versus Monier from 2007 that missing findings are not structural error and that real prejudice has to be shown. And on the record here, it appears that the father easily could have rebutted all of the Section 3044 uh, factors. Uh, instead, the Court of Appeal held that the error was prejudicial because uh, because of more abstract reasons uh, about the importance of putting uh, of the judge putting pen to paper and writing out all of the factors and the findings and that errors or um, or gaps in the reasoning or the evidence would be revealed in the writing uh, uh, writing out of the decision and these are all you know Jeff I I uh, happen to have a uh, a case that involved this issue at the time FP versus Monier was being considered in the Supreme Court. And I, so I, I read all the briefs in the FP Monier decision. I, yeah. And I agreed that it should be reversed on uh, structural error grounds, that, uh, yeah. that omissions should be, should be structural error and they defy harmless error review. Uh, it seems like this, uh, the Hutchins court agrees, but that is not what the Supreme Court held. It held that you had to actually go through and find, you know, analyze the factors and determine that the outcome would have been different. Yeah. Well, it is an unpublished case. I hate to keep beating that drum, but it is unpublished. I, I, before we hit the record button, you and I were chatting about this case and we we're talking about, well, what happens after remand here? And is it just the same old judge uh, going to just rehash uh, and, and go through the motion of, of making the findings? So why bother? And I said, well, wait, Tim, they get a new, tri a new judge assigned. After you get a reversal, you have the right to make a 170.6 challenge and you, uh, educated me that oh wait jeff you only get a new judge after a reversal on appeal if you uh, are going to get a new trial and here there's no new trial so it'd be the same old judge uh going through these findings and uh yeah it does seem like a bit of a waste of time yeah i uh, th that was my prediction that that on remand i suspect that the that the family judge is just going to say, okay, I, I omitted the findings. Well, here are the findings. Uh, they support the same outcome. Uh, yeah. So I think the appellant may have won the battle here, but is it going, is she going to win the war? I tend to doubt it. Yeah. I think uh, this uh, unfortunately might've been a wasted effort. Yeah. And, uh, and only to result in an unpublished opinion. Yeah. All right. Let's move on to a couple cases that deal with uh, some interesting points of appellate procedure that, uh, that I think are always interesting for trial and appellate practitioners to keep in mind. So in the, the first case, uh, the first case is Garg versus Garg. It is a published case out of the, uh, the, the fourth district division three, and it deals with the, the, the timely filing of a notice of appeal uh, when you're using e-filing. Uh, the upshot here is that untimely appeals may be excused if there was a mishap with the electronic filing process. So we all know we'll start with the, the maxim that a timely notice of appeal is ordinarily an absolute uh, uh, jurisdictional prerequisite. Prerequ yeah, you don't need this case. If it's an absolute uh, jurisdictional prerequisite, either it's in 60 days or it's outside of 60 days. You don't need a long case to explain it. Yeah, and yet uh, <laughs> yet this case involves, an, the, the opinion involves an interesting uh, a city bus tour through the various types of exceptions to this absolute 
uh, uh, jurisdictional rule. Uh, there, uh, the upshot is that there definitely are exceptions to the jurisdictional rule that a timely appeal is the absolute prerequisite. The, the exception at issue in GARG relates to problems with electronic filing. So here's a holding from GARG. If you attempt to timely electronically file a notice of appeal, but something goes wrong in the electronic filing process, don't worry, all is not lost, maybe. Here's, here are the two things you have to do. First, if you have uh, some trouble t uh, timely filing a notice of appeal because of the e-filing system, first, file the notice of appeal as soon thereafter as practicable. And again, you always have to file the notice of appeal in the Superior Court, not the Court of Appeal. And then at the same time you are uh, filing, curing your, your, uh, your defect with the filing, at the same time you refile that notice of appeal, file a motion in the Court of Appeal this time explaining what happened and showing good cause why the notice of appeal should be deemed filed as of the date of your timely attempt. And cite rules of court uh, 8.77 subdivision D. Uh, that's what happened to the appellant here. Uh, the court found that the that, that the appellant uh, did um, uh, did provide a good uh, uh, explanation, but it didn't file the notice of appeal as soon thereafter as practicable. Uh, so you have to do these things immediately after you notice the defect. The appellant and GARG waited 29 days before spotting the problem and refiling the notice of appeal, and that was just too long. The Court of Appeal held that the appellant did show good cause for the technical foul up. In this case, the legal assistant apparently had transmitted the notice of appeal to their e-filing vendor, but then for reasons unknown, the vendor just didn't get it filed. Uh, the court concluded that the appellant did not detect the error and seek relief as soon thereafter as practicable. So the mm. uh, the appeal was dismissed. Yeah, this is an interesting case. Provides a great roadmap for what happens if you try to electronically file and uh, you're not uh, able to get it on file on time through no fault of your own. So that was helpful. I can't say I agree with the outcome here in this particular case because especially in Orange County, there have been times where I file things and there's a delay in getting them back from the Superior Court, a conformed copy. And here the Appellants Council submitted declarations about checking in periodically on the status of the filing. It's not like he uh, filed it and then uh, 29 days uh, elapsed and then he checked in on the file. There was a lot of stuff that happened in between. I, I probably would have come out uh, the other way. And especially because the court of appeal went to the trouble of making this roadmap of what to do. This is kind of a new area in terms of a exception to the uh, jurisdictional rule. I would have given this appellant a pass and said, uh, yeah, but for in the future, we're warning uh, other appellate lawyers. If you don't get the conformed copy back right, a, right away from the superior court, uh, uh, file, file a, a corrected motion and, and a corrected notice and, and a motion. Yeah, it's interesting that you should uh, that you should mention that about um, about the the delays that sometimes occur because that was uh, that was what the appellant's attorney argued. Uh, he argued that, and this was an appellate specialist, by the way. So this yep. uh, again, these things happen to the best of them. The uh, uh, the appellate specialist for the appellant was looking at the docket and said, oh, initially said I wouldn't worry too much about it because of delays in the clerk's office. I I often you know, like you said, Jeff, I, I often uh, see delays of several days or even weeks before these show up. So I wouldn't worry too much about it. And it wasn't until apparently close to day 29 where they said, you know what, we better do something about this. And and they learned finally that the uh, that their notice of appeal had not, in fact, been successfully filed. And so that's when they tried yeah. again. So I agree. I thought this was um, when it comes down to but uh, maybe the upshot here is that when they are making exceptions to the jurisdictional rule, they're going to make them rather small. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I want to see a bunch of motions. You pointed out to me also, Jeff, that uh, something I, I didn't notice when I first read it, that this is a per curiam opinion. It is not, it doesn't have a lead author. Um, it's not joined. It's just uh, an opinion of the court. And uh, I hadn't thought about why that might be, but I wonder if you had any takes. I, I wonder if it is because they are making a uh, making ex an exception to a jurisdictional rule, and they they seem to be kind of poking, uh, taking a little bit of air out of the balloon that this is an absolute yeah. uh, jurisdictional rule that cannot 
contemplate any any exceptions and yet they go down and they list at least four recognized exceptions and here they make an you know uh, acknowledge a fifth exception and uh i wonder if you had any thoughts on that jeff no i observed it but i i can't imagine why this would be the a decision that they would make uh without a uh, author yeah okay let's uh and then let's let's move to the other uh, case that deals with the interesting appellate procedure point. Uh, in this case, a dismissed appeal was held to be not on the merits, even uh, because the uh, even after the appeal was dismissed on mootness grounds. Yeah. So, and, and, and a quick warning to our listeners: if you've not had a full cup of coffee yet, make sure pause the podcast, go get a cup of coffee, and and make sure you're fully caffeinated because this decision is a uh, brain twister. All right. Well, let's uh, let's try to try to take it slow here. So, uh, this was an appeal that was dismissed. Um, but uh, as I noted after reading the opinion, that there may be a silver lining if you have an appeal dismissed because the underlying judgment may no longer have any preclusive value. Uh, that's what happened here in this published opinion in Parkford Owners for a Better Community versus Windeshausen. Uh, this is out of the third district. Uh, in July 2022. So in this case, a neighborhood group challenged the expansion of a storage facility on CEQA grounds. And uh, we had just talked about CEQA with Peter Prowse in our last episode, uh, Jeff. The, the trial court rejected the challenge and the neighborhood group appealed. But pending the appeal, the, the expansion project went forward. And uh, after it went forward and completed, the appeal was rendered moot, leading the court of appeal to dismiss. So then the neighborhood group challenged the issuance of a business license to the storage facility because it, it had lost that battle. So it needs to find some other way to, to gum up the works in this development project. So it, uh, so it challenged the business license to the storage facility that it wanted to stop, this time on zoning grounds. Uh, the storage company this time filed a motion for judgment on the pleadings. Uh, it said that, look, this, these issues have already been, they, they, already, they already shot their wad on this one. They, uh, so now it's res judicata, issue preclusion, uh, collateral estoppel. Uh, they argue that the issues in the new lawsuit were, were encompassed already in the, in the judgment that was now final. Uh, and the trial court granted the motion. But the court of appeal reversed, Jeff. Uh, it seems like a good argument that any kind of uh, arguments uh, toward obstruction of this storage facility uh, project, the uh, the neighborhood group needed to assert in that first lawsuit, and which they lost. Uh, but the Court of Appeal disagreed. It said that res judicata and claim uh, preclusion require a final judgment. And here, the prior judgment, though it was challenged on appeal, uh, was dismissed on mootness grounds. And a dismissal solely on mootness grounds does not result in a final judgment, quote, on the merits as required to apply the doctrine of res judicata or preclusion. Jeff, I, I'm not sure about this holding. When the trial court entered the judgment here, it had preclusive effect. And had the appellant not appealed, it would have retained its preclusive effect. But the court held that merely by taking the notice of appeal, and then failing to get a decision before the corpus of the appeal was destroyed, thus rendering the appeal moot, that had the, re, the, the effect of eliminating the preclusive effect of the judgment. So the appellant essentially gets a free do-over here. I wondered if, if uh, dismissing an appeal on mootness grounds uh, destroys the preclusive effect of a judgment. Could the appellant do the same thing by, for example, by other types of dismissal of the appeal? What what say if the appellant just files a notice of appeal but doesn't file the $775 filing fee that goes along with it and the appeal is dismissed? Does that destroy the preclusive effect of the judgment? Yeah. Uh, you know, normally I would just say, Tim, it's an unpublished decision. Uh, <laughs> but this one's published. Uh, it's very counterintuitive. And, um, you know, in this instance, uh, it were... Uh, actions outside of the appellant's control, the completion of the project that rendered it moot. But you raise a good point. Could an appellant create mootness or other issues uh, to cause a dismissal and put itself in a better position than uh, had the appeal never been filed? Uh, I It's counterintuitive, this result to me. Yeah. Well, and, and, and as you mentioned um, about mootness, you know, I, I'm not sure if there's a difference between it a, an appeal that's dismissed on mootness grounds and an appeal that's dismissed for, for other grounds. But I would suspect that if this issue came up again, that if a court were to follow the Parkford owner's case, 
it would hold it to its facts and it would only apply it if it uh, if it were a, a case that also involved an appeal that was dismissed on mootness grounds and not for some other reason. Yeah, 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 yeah. All right. Um, okay, let, let's talk a, a, a quick discussion, um, just kind of an aside on a case that was recently taken up by the Supreme Court on a petition for review. This uh, this was the Quash, Quash versus California Commerce Club case that... Uh, that we discussed in a previous episode, Jeff, it was about where a uh, where a, uh, a litigant had litigated a case for 13 months before finally petitioning, uh, moving to compel arbitration. And the court said, sure, no problem, uh, because under the California Supreme Court precedent, um, merely uh, driving up costs and expenses in litigation does not constitute prejudice um, in order to deny a petition uh, to compel arbitration. And there was a dissenting opinion that says, what are you talking about? The whole point of a right of arbitration is for speedy and uh, efficient results. And that is the prejudice here, because by litigating expensively for 13 months, you have denied the, the very purpose of arbitration. And so now the, uh, the California Supreme Court has taken up review of that uh, decision. Uh, David, Ed David Edinger notes that the opinion was filed less than two weeks before the United States Supreme Court held that prejudice to the other side is not an essential is not essential to finding an arbitration waiver in federal courts. Uh, and so I wonder if the California Supreme Court may be um, looking to align its its holding with the uh, United States Supreme Court. Yeah, I'll be interested to see what the California Supreme Court does with that. And then just uh, just uh, for bragging rights, Jeff, uh, the Quash opinion was originally unpublished until I filed an amicus request for publication and resulted in it, in it being partially published and uh, now taken up on review by the Supreme Court. Yeah. Conclusive proof. The second district has clerks uh, listening to this podcast. That's right. <laughs> okay. Uh, the last, uh, last case before we get to our tidbits, uh, this involves a, a bit of trial procedure. Uh, the upshot being that, that a, uh, the, a fatal error in a judicial cost memorandum um, led to a, uh, uh, may lead to uh, losing your your right to costs in a case. So uh, uh, in this case, uh, uh, what happened is that the uh, the successful plaintiff filed a judicial counsel form, uh, MC-010 for the memo, memo of costs. Uh, but it turn, turns out that form, Jeff, has been letting us all down because the memo of costs is required to be verified. And verified means signed under penalty of perjury. But Judicial Council Form MC-010 does not have the penalty of perjury language. Uh, so if you, although the, the majority here held that uh, uh, the case is Sarabian versus Triangle Truck Center out of the 5th District, the, the majority held that, nah, it's close enough, even though it doesn't have the penalty of perjury language, we're still going to call it verified. Uh, but uh, in dissent, Justice Kathleen Meehan, uh, I, I thought, had a, uh, had a more persuasive reasoning that uh, following the statutory language, verified means signed under, under penalty of perjury. And this is an evidentiary showing, because if you remember, this, the, the way the burden shifting works in a memo of costs is that the memo of costs is an evidentiary showing, prima facie case of what cost the prevailing party incurred. And then when you file a motion to strike or tax those costs, the moving party has to bear that burden with evidence. And so if the moving party has to prepare declarations signed under penalty of, uh, of perjury to overcome the evidentiary burden, then it stands to reason that that initial evidentiary burden needs to be on the same footing, i.e. supported by a declaration signed under penalty of perjury. So does that mean for all your memo of costs in the future, Tim, you're going to be typing in extra language above your signature saying under penalty of perjury? Uh, yeah, you bet I will. Uh, I don't want to... Uh, now that that argument that argument is on the wall now, as we yeah. say, it is not a it's not a frivolous argument. Another interesting point that Justice Meehan uh, pointed out in her dissent is that the Judicial Council did get it right in uh, in its form for uh, appellate costs after appeal form APP zero one three that does include the penalty of perjury oh. language on it. So it does seem like it was an uh, this is an oversight by the Judicial Council in the uh, MC-010 memo of cost form. Yeah, interesting. Okay. I don't know if it counts as being on the wall or out there, if it's a dissent 
in an unpublished decision. I don't know if that's an argument that I would ever make in an appeal that uh, the memo of cost should have been uh, verified under penalty of perjury, but I'll, uh, I'll tuck it away. <laughs> so you're not, you're not going to make your memo of cost under penalty of perjury? Well, yeah, there's that, but I don't know if in an appeal I would ever attack a uh, memo of cost for a failure of uh, proof. Yeah. All right. All right. Let's tackle some tidbits here. Um, you know, uh, Tim, before our podcast was uh, published a couple of years ago, there was another little podcast called Serial about the murder conviction of Aidan Syed. He was a high schooler in the Midwest. Did you ever uh, listen to that podcast? You told me about this one. I have not made it to that episode, though. Well, I uh, highly recommend it. It was a case about, yeah, a high school kid. He was convicted of killing his ex-girlfriend. And the podcast covered uh, the case and some loose threads that his lawyers were pursuing in post-conviction relief and uh, trying to get the case overturned. And all of the efforts by his defense lawyers were not successful in getting him a new trial, ultimately through the appellate process. But recently... The prosecutors in the case filed a motion to vacate his criminal conviction, to give him a new trial, and also to let him go out of jail after 20 years uh, to be on the outside while he waits for a new trial if the prosecutors decide to, uh, to prosecute again. And this was all based on some information uh, that the uh, prosecutors unveiled about two other possible suspects. Uh, yeah, it's a super interesting case. You don't often see prosecutors making a motion to uh, vacate a uh, conviction and, and casting doubt on their own conviction process. No, that's really interesting. And it was I was trying to remember the name of the book that I read several years ago about uh, a similar kind of story where they, the uh, police and prosecutors were convinced they found the right uh, the right guy uh, for this murder, although. You know, there were eight out of the 10 puzzle pieces fit, but there were two really weird ones that didn't fit. And uh, after years and years and years, they were finally able to get uh, uh, get the, in, you know, the, the wrongly accused out of prison. Uh, they, they, they found the, uh, the so-called one-armed man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it'll be interesting because, you know, this podcast, you know, putting the facts and the law aside, this podcast generated enormous sympathy uh, for this criminal defendant. And uh, I think there's an HBO show and a related podcast that came out. It'd be interesting to see if the prosecutors decide to, uh, to even mount a second prosecution or if they'll just let them go free. Yeah. Well, it's, and it's interesting that it took the, it took the prosecutors to put this on uh, the, uh, some of these problems apparently had gone up to the, uh, to the trial judge and to the court of, even the trial judge was convinced at one point to grant a new trial, but then uh, on appeal, the grant of new trial was reversed, right? Right. Yeah. Yeah, that's correct. Does that correct. suggest that? Um, does that suggest an institutional thumb on the scale in favor of prosecutors? After you've gotten <laughs> a, gr a guilty verdict, um, it's going to take the getting the the you have a better chance getting the prosecutors to come around uh, than than judges. Yeah, that's. <laughs> uh, if you don't have the prosecutors on your side, it's hard to get a new trial. Let's just say that. Yeah. All right. Um, next tidbit, the, the Supreme Court will review whether uh, L.A. District Attorney Gascon may order all deputies not to enforce the three strikes law. The Supreme Court granted Los Angeles District Attorney George Gascon's petition seeking review in Association of Deputy District Attorneys of L.A. County versus Gascon. The case involves whether Gascon has the authority to prevent the prosecutors in his office from invoking the three strikes law to obtain sentencing enhancements. The trial court sided with the union and so did the court of appeal ruling in a published opinion earlier this year that Gascon does not have the discretion to adopt a policy that completely frustrates the purpose and mandate of the three strikes law. Uh, Jeff, you and I discussed this previously on episode 38 of the podcast. Yeah. Interesting separation of powers arguments and I'll be interested to see what the Supreme court does with this one. Yeah, every month, Jeff, uh, the uh, Orange County Lawyer magazine publishes an, uh, a column by Justice William Bed Bedsworth of the 4th District 3rd Division here in Santa Ana. Uh, this month's uh, column, I thought, uh, was interesting. He talked about uh, oral argument. Justice Bedsworth says that preparing for oral argument is really hard on the justices. Uh, a couple of uh, interesting quotes that I thought I'd share with the audience. Quote, this is uh, talking about oral argument. This is counsel's last shot. If there are things I didn't buy in the briefing or didn't understand, this is the last chance to get into, into sync. Here's another quote. I, sp I spend the weekend or the night before 
pre uh, preparing for each of the 12 to 15 oral arguments I'll hear this week, and I have to be sharp. And uh, again, I'm worn out by the end of the day. I watch a lot of baseball on TV, but I seldom see the ninth inning dur during oral argument week. And then finally, uh, we don't get many submitted these days. A few would be, uh, a few more would be welcome. As Justice Ryler's Dam used to say, 30 minutes, counsel, was your briefing that bad? <laughs> yeah. And what made, uh, what made me uh, enjoy this column, Jeff, is, uh, is uh, having a chance to put my myself in the shoes of justices preparing for oral argument. Sometimes I get out there and I think, well, I'm just going to try to try to put a new spin on things. I'm just going to really come at this a different direction. And I would be very concerned about that now after reading this column. They've uh, they've tried to get into sync in Justice yeah. Bedsworth's words here with my arguments. Uh, maybe I try to kind of nudge them a different way or uh, maybe, but but uh, you don't want to tax them too much because they spent a lot of a lot of time, and it's tough for them to uh, uh, to sit up there and listen to all those arguments. You want to you want to be familiar. You want to uh, make them feel that they understood correctly. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Um, another uh, another tidbit about oral argument in the Supreme Court in recent years of California uh, between 200. Uh, well, here's a just a better set up the, the tidbit. The question is, how long is the wait between briefing and oral argument? So in the Supreme Court, the answer is between 250 and 340 days. That's eight to 10 months. Compare that to the Court of Appeal average for the entire appeal in civil appeals uh, from notice of appeal to opinion. It's 568 days yeah, um two now again words for you record preparation <laughs> right right so uh, but but just the portion for um uh for waiting uh waiting for the oral argument after briefing you're waiting oh okay uh, you know eight to ten months just to get set for oral argument uh ah, so it's a uh, so it's a much longer process yeah um and re relatedly uh, Supreme Court's uh, productivity seems to have dropped in recent years. This was a piece by John Eisenberg recently. Uh, yearly out output, says John Eisenberg, of written opinions out of the Supreme Court has plummeted an alarming 61% compared to a decade ago. This leads, says Eisenberg, to more uncertainty in the law, more wasteful litigation, and less confident advice to clients. Interesting. Interesting. All right. Hey, let's do uh, a quick update about the Potter Handy lawsuit. We reported in, earlier opposites, uh, in an earlier episode about a joint lawsuit between the L.A. and San Francisco District Attorney's Office against the Potter Handy law firm for filing too many ADA lawsuits. They were deemed to be shakedown lawsuits. And a hearing was held in late August. There's a hearing on the Potter Handy firm's demur invoking Civil Code Section 47, the litigation privilege. And surprisingly, the court sustained Potter Handy's demur. The uh, case was thrown out, at least out of civil court. Uh, the uh, court's decision left room for the possibility of maybe future criminal prosecution against the Potter Handy firm. And uh, last I checked, the L.A. and San Francisco DA's attorney were still mulling whether or not to appeal. They have uh, 60 days or so to appeal, depending on if they use any of the exceptions to the 60-day uh, notice of appeal period. That's that's interesting. Well, I'm yeah. a little surprised by that, but I guess that leaves uh, that means that the only remedy then is uh, what sanctions motions, one twenty eight point seven motions in individual cases. Yeah, yeah. The, you know, federal courts. This was primarily about federal court activity, and federal judges mm -hmm. in this context have been known to uh, set OSCs and to target uh, lawyers who are abusing the system. Oh, right, right. Okay. Um, the Supreme Court retroactivity decision uh, presents another challenge to the three strikes law. Uh, so the California Supreme Court continues to make comments suggesting that the three strikes law may be in trouble. The latest comments come from Justices Liu and Groban, dissenting from the majority in the case in Ray Milton. Milton is another opinion dealing with retroactivity. The rule on retroactivity is that court opinions that change the law in criminal proceedings are retroactive only if they are substantive, not if they're merely procedural. But the question is, what about sentencing uh, a sentencing hearing where the judge categorized out-of-state convictions as violent for purposes of the, of the three, three strikes law? 
The court has held that the right to jury trial attaches to such hearings. So if you were deprived of the right to jury when you were convicted years and years ago, can you collaterally challenge your three strikes sentencing? Well, only if the rule guaranteeing the right to jury was substantive. And in the case in Ray Milton, in a five to two split decision, the Supreme Court holds no. Quote, the Gallardo rule, uh, which is the right to jury in category categorizing out-of-state convictions under, under the three strikes law was procedural in nature. And that's where uh, Justices Goodwin, Liu, and Josh Groban uh, both dissented. Uh, Justice Liu writes that, quote, the characterization of Gallardo in today's opinion may reopen serious questions as to the constitutionality of the three strikes law. And Justice Liu says that the Gallardo rule protected the constitutional integrity of three strikes and that this opinion underscores that integrity, thus making it more subject to challenge. Now, Jeff, that's uh, the, the the setup to this dissent was rather long and, and a bit circuitous. But the, the reason I wanted to uh, to read that out to our audience is uh, to be on the lookout for uh, for serious challenges to the three strikes law, uh, obviously, um, uh, the Los Angeles district attorney has been challenging that right. in one decision. And uh, then we've got uh, these signals from uh, Justices Liu and Groban that um, that it uh, that they're that is under some fire. Yeah. Yeah. I imagine the criminal defendants who have sentencing enhancements imposed due to the three strikes law for out of store out of state convictions would find that the process of categorizing those out-of-state convictions as predicate offenses for three strikes law would find those substantive as opposed to procedural when you think about the impact on their lives and adding uh, decades of sentencing uh, to their to their prison terms. Right. Okay, two more tidbits. Here's uh, here's my last one and then, uh, then let you end, Jeff. Um, okay. Okay, th this is kind of a fun one. Uh, word choice. Um, so it's, it's a fun one, but it's also slightly controversial. So... Um, Alien or non-citizen, which do you use in your briefs? Uh, judges okay. Bea and Mergua uh, have different takes from the in a recent Ninth Circuit opinion. The case is uh, Avales versus Garland, uh, September 2022 opinion. Uh, Chief Justice Mergua uses the term non-citizen to describe the petitioner in this case. The chief judge gives two reasons. First, the Supreme Court of the United States of late has been using the term non-citizen, despite the fact that the statutes use the term alien. And the second reason is that the Chicago Manual of Style says to avoid terms that, quote, reasonable readers might find offensive or distracting. Judge Bea disagrees in his concurrence. He says uh, he has three main, uh, main points. He says that the term non-citizen is imprecise. The petitioner here is not a non-citizen. He's a citizen of Mexico. The term non-citizen suggests the person may be a stateless person, which is a different uh, different kind yeah. of thing, uh, or a subject of a monarchy, uh, such as Spain or Saudi Arabia, or a person in a territory or province, all of which uh, makes the term non-citizen imprecise and incorrect here. The term alien means a person from somewhere else, which is the more precise and correct meaning, Judge Bea argues, or reasons. Judge Bea, the second reason Judge Bea gives is that uh, not really a reason, but some interesting context. Judge Bea uh, was himself an alien. Uh, he hailed from uh, Spain and then from Cuba, and he was subject at one point in his life to deportation proceedings. Uh, and Judge Bea personally does not regard the term alien to be offensive. Right. Uh, third reason Judge Bea gives, alien is a statutory word with statutory meaning. The judi judiciary is not at liberty to replace statutory words with terms of its own liking. And the final reason offered by Judge Bea, this rift in the language puts litigants to a hard choice of using the precise statutory word or the less precise judicial word. Yeah. 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 There's words like, you know, uh, homeless versus unhoused. There's lots of buzzwords out there that... Uh... You just never know. My word of thumb uh, or my rule of thumb usually is to research the appellate justices who are going to be deciding my case. Look at how they've written recent cases about that subject matter and use whatever words they use. Yeah. I thought the uh, what made this one particularly tough is that the statute uses the term alien. And so if yeah. you're talking, of, you're making an analysis where, and in, even in the chief judge uh, Mergua's uh, opinion, uh, the word alien comes up several times because she's 
citing um, uh, uh, the statutory language. Mm -hmm. And so you have to move back and forth between uh, two different words. So it makes it a little bit confusing. So I, I Absolutely. kind of uh, appreciated uh, uh, Judge Bea's point that about the rift in language, making it awkward for litigants to uh, to argue these points. Yeah, yeah, good point. All right, let me wrap it up with a couple, uh, two last tid, uh, tidbits. Uh, one, on an earlier episode, we had attorney Matt Strugar on the show to talk about an anti-slap matter pending before the California Supreme Court. And that issue in that case was whether tenants picking out, picketing outside of someone's private residence over an eviction was a public issue covered by the anti-slap uh, statute or merely a private dispute about one eviction that was not worthy of anti-slap protection. And the California Supreme Court ended up siding with the protesters. Uh, the uh, court uh, found that the Court of Appeal erred in holding that the demonstration outside the home did not constitute speech in connection with a public issue under the anti slaps uh, catch-all provision. And the court clarified that free speech activity that might simultaneously involve both a private dispute and a broader public issue, uh, both can be true. And the existence of a private dispute does not preclude a finding by a court that a broader public issue exists. So it's a big win for uh, people who bring anti-slap motions, especially when you're trying to fit it within the catch-all provisions of the anti-slap law. Yeah, that yeah, seems like a right result. And then uh, file this under, uh, I don't know what you'd file this under, but when, you, uh, when you're drafting a brief, Tim, do you ever write a sentence followed by a blank to remind you to fill in the site later? Oh, all the time. Yeah. <laughs> in Arega versus Bay Area Rapid Transit District, a September 14th decision, the appellant did nothing but have blanks in his opening brief. So he'd have sentences followed by uh, uh, parentheses, CT dash period. And he didn't fill in the page number and uh, he didn't have any record sites. And one reason might've been that he forgot to fill them in, but uh, a more likely reason from reading the opinion is that uh, none of the evidence that he needed to rely on for his arguments was actually in the record. Um, the first district did not appreciate uh, what he did and uh, predictably affirmed, but as a good reminder, you know, whenever I finalize my brief, I always do a word search for the word site and for underscores, just in case. Yeah, that's a good practice. And I know I saw that same thing that you did, Jeff, about, uh, I think it was in a footnote, the court mentioned that the appellant had uh, had not made a motion to augment the record. Uh, the appellant had indicated that, oh, well, all the evidence I need didn't make it into the clerk's transcript. This is really the, the clerk's screw up. And the court said, it's the appellant's responsibility to make sure the record is complete for the appeal. Uh, you didn't make a motion to augment and all these uh, uh, blank citations to the record are not going to cut it. Yeah. Oops. So yeah. that uh, that provided some good authority that that goes into uh, into my file under the tag respondents toolkit. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, I think that wraps up this episode. Again, we want to thank Case Text for sponsoring the podcast. And each week we include links to the cases we discuss using Case Text. And listeners of the podcast can find a 25% life. 25% lifetime discount available to them if they sign up at casetext.com slash calp. That's casetext.com slash C-A-L-P. And we always love hearing from our uh, our listeners about suggestions for future episodes, topics, or other guests. We have, a, we have a file and we are dutifully working through that list of guests to get on the show uh, that have been suggested by our guests, uh, by, our, uh, by our listeners. So please send them in to info at calpodcast.com or... Uh, or you can email uh, Jeff or me individually if you have our email addresses. All right. See you next time. You have just listened to the California Appellant Podcast, a discussion of timely trial tips and the latest cases and news coming from the California Court of Appeal and the California Supreme Court. For more information about the cases discussed in today's episode, our hosts, and other episodes, visit the California Appellate Law Podcast website at calpodcast.com. That's calpodcast.com. Thanks to Jonathan Caro for our intro music. Thank you for listening, and please join us again.